One of the things about the exam that probably feels very old-fashioned is this focus on things like schematic design, design development, construction documents, this sort of uh, old way of thinking about it where we have a set of drawings, that set of drawings has plans, and then it has uh, elevations, then it has uh, sections, then it has uh, wall sections and interior elevations. Uh, so it has this whole process that it kind of moves through, a very specific way that we generally think of these things, and that's a package of drawings, right? And that feels very sort of old school in that way, and that like, why would you do that? Why not just give somebody a 3D image that they can move around and they can look at some sort of uh, building information modeling system, a BIM, a Revit, a ARCHICAD, something like that, where they can actually see the whole thing together and then they can run their own sections and they can uh, sort of decide which part of the plan they want to look at. So there's actually a movement that's happening where architects are instead of doing the sort of normal run of uh, drawings that explain the, from a contractual standpoint uh, what's uh, being uh, suggested, uh, they're actually just saying, all right, we'll do the model and then we'll hand the model over to you and then you can build it. And so whoever's building it does some part of the model and the people who are doing the initial design do some part of the model and somewhere in between all the decisions get made and then they have it, it's now their model and they build it. And the architects never actually produce a set of plans, a set of elevations, a set of uh, sections, a set of uh, schedules for the doors, things like that, uh, that that's only in the model. So there's something great about that. There's something really interesting about uh, how the, the different possibilities that that might bring. But it does create a certain complexity to our situation that is worth thinking about. It's unlikely on the exam that it'll get too esoteric in its discussions. But it is important to understand the sort of basic idea that the contract documents are part of a legal construct between two other entities. And so there's a reason why we have a very straightforward idea of the sort of legal narrative that we're putting together. So you open up a set of drawings, and there's the site plan, there's the floor plan, there's the elevation. There's sort of this, you're telling a story that's through this set of drawings. And it's very understandable and repetitive. It's just like a previous story, just with a new design. So we totally get how the floor plan works. We totally get how an elevation works. We totally get what's meaningful in the section, in the wall sections, because we've seen them before. And not only have we seen them before, but they fit into this legal pattern that is well known and well understood. Then we start talking about this idea of just handing over a digital model. Well, who made sure that all the rebar was in the digital model in the right place? And who made sure that the ADA issues were fully understood? And who made sure that if something uh, got changed in the wall thickness of one spot, that those ADA issues we just talked about were still accurate? Uh, so there's a whole series of issues that become a little muddled once you have multiple people and there's no final clarity of the narrative. Uh, if I have clarity of the narrative and I'm handing over this information, there's a bunch of elements that are very clearly understood and clearly expressed. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that isn't clearly expressed and is therefore not part of the narrative. Once we hand over a whole model, the expectation is that everything is in the model and everything is therefore in that narrative. But is it? Have you actually spent all the time putting everything in? Is it understood that if we don't do that, somebody else does? So there's a whole series of kind of confusions that I think are happening and likely to happen with the BIM models. And over the years, we'll figure out a way that everybody understands how to do it. But right now, it's still a little bit up in the air. And so the contracts have not yet caught up to that. And as an industry, we should be very careful about these things. So just as a um, sort of test of imagination, imagine that you've worked on a project, you've made a 3D model, you've handed it over to a developer who has their own uh, architectural interns working on the model. They alter and change things. They add it together. They then build from that. And at no point there were set floor plans or set anything else that needed to get done. Uh, and so they just kind of built it all on their own from that initial model that you made. And then imagine, all right, four years later, something goes wrong. The realization that there's a giant 
structural crack happening in one of the foundation walls where there's a point load for the steel beam that's loaded there. And the question is, whose fault is it? It's gone into litigation. It's now four years later, there was never a set of drawings. There was never a set, like here's the construction set. There's just this 3D model. 3D model had many, many lives to it. Uh, at what point is it your responsibility? At what point is it somebody else's responsibility? Imagine a judge or the jury or somebody you know, in that system trying to look at this information and have any idea how they could make a decision from it. If you have a set of drawings, there's a set narrative, there's a set idea of what's being expressed. It's part of a very long history of how that works. So we can look at that set of drawings and say, well, it doesn't have this information on it. I look at all these other sets of drawings, they all do. This one really ought to have had that information. Why? Because everybody else did, right? There's a history, there's a precedent to it. There isn't that same precedent to the 3D models. So it's not understood about how this is going to fit in the litigative world of architecture and construction. There are plenty of examples where people have had suits and problems and, and things have been worked out. So it's not that there's no information about it. It's just that this is a complication of the kind of current way of thinking about these issues. So uh, just kind of putting that out there as an idea think about the fact that one of the ways to think about this is that when you think about something like a set of construction documents, contract documents, if you think of those as a narrative that's telling a specific story, that story is the design intent of the project, which is what the architect's role is. The architect's role is to create the design intent and then come up with the documentation that tells that narrative of that design intent. And then that gets handed over to somebody else they then build from that documentation of that design intent, that narrative, and that they can then understand what it is they're supposed to build and then go and build that. As soon as we start doing something that's different from the normal, then there's a lot of complication about, well, who's responsible? Where does the responsibility lie? At what point in time does responsibility shift? All of those kinds of issues. So this is not saying that designs shouldn't be interesting and pushing the limits and, and trying out different possibilities. This is saying that there's a legal construct that we are fitting into, and if you are going to do something that's different from that legal construct, it better be very, very clear who's responsible and how the process is going to work.